as the cyber world burns, 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 right? Because the cyber world's on fire right now. The era, uh, force, the era of the mega hack. That's what that's what yeah. the news media is calling it. Yeah, it's uh, it it's been an exhausting uh, couple of months, really. But man, I I'm just yeah. You're t- I know you're this, tired. This exchange hack is just uh but but it's brutal. Forrest, I mean, it's like we had the solar winds thing happening back in December, and then we've got to handle cases for the 0365 breach, and then that follows it up by the Excelion breach, and now we're handling cases here in Utah for the for the the Exchange server breach, and of course, the I'm sure the audience wants to know, well, what's how does this soap opera end and it's not pretty i could tell you for for some of our clients it's some nasty stuff out there guys and it's so sad i feel like for us sometimes i feel like when we're on the phone call with our clients we're like a, a doctor giving them the bad news that they have cancer mm-hmm. or something you know that's how bad the situation is for some of our, our clients out there yeah it's uh it's never uh it's never an easy conversation to to you know uh, get somebody on the line and say look here's all the stuff that i'm seeing uh you you really you really need to get some incident response going here um you know it's it's the the bearer of bad news uh no nobody wants to be the one to to have to deliver that but no um but there there are there is some good news out of this story and there's the good news is that we're making as an industry we're making progress on solving all of the exposed breaches all the exchange servers out there that are that are exposed. The numbers are going down. Uh, I did. I don't know if you read this. I read this article about the cyber insurance company at bay, and they said one in 190 of their businesses are being impacted by the exchange server breach. Something like uh, mostly small to medium sized businesses are being hit more than the bigger players. The enterprise folks have got their stuff patched. They're under control. It's these smaller players that really need the love and the help. Yeah, yeah, it was some of the numbers that I was I was seeing, um, and these are a, a few days out of date. Um, uh, as of the fourteenth, I think that there were approximately sixty two thousand exchange servers that were still potentially vulnerable to this, um, and then uh, they they had done uh, some some more number crunching of the the IPs that they saw with web shells on them. Uh, I, I, I believe they had seen about 12,861 unique IPs that had, uh, a, an active web shell on them Whoa. and, uh, 22,731 shells. So that means that some of these machines have multiple web shells on them, uh, at a given time. So, I mean, they're, they're just getting, you know, triple teamed in some cases by, uh, uh, these, these threat actors. And so it's. Um, yeah, I mean, at this point, uh, yeah, if, if your exchange hasn't, um, you know, if you haven't patched your exchange, just nuke it from orbit. Like you you just need to (laughs) go from backups and yeah, it's, it's scorched earth at this point. You you just need to start from a known good baseline and try and recover that way. So let's give the folks at home, let's give them the update on the story. That story goes... There are two parts here, as the cyber world burns. The first part is there's a lot of research being published out there, especially from FireEye. We'll include the link to the FireEye report, the little malware that could. I love that title of their report. But, you know, they looked in the Hafnium. We mentioned Hafnium in our last episode. They are part of the APTs that are behind this exchange server breach. That's just one part of the story. But the tools that Hafnium uses are pretty remarkable. These these tools aren't new stuff for us. These things have been around since like 20. 2012. It's a it's a tool called China Chapa. The Chapa, China Chapa. I love I love saying it, man. It's a web shell. It's really small. I mean, it's like four kilobytes in size. It, it's not new. I mentioned it. it's been around. I mean, a heck of a long time. But Hafnium was using this web shell to try to remote control these web servers, and the web shell has two parts. There's a client part, which is the executable pot file, and then there's a receiver or server part. Um, and, and what they're, you know, able to do is pretty remarkable. A lot of command and control features, password brute force options, uh, code obfuscation, file and, and DB management. Uh, it even has a GUI to it, but you fast forward to today forest. And what's interesting about this stuff is half is being used to execute this web 
this web shell stuff, this uh, this attack on on all these businesses. It's pretty fascinating. You know, it's like it it's such a small tool, four kilobytes, and that it's so powerful in what it's able to execute. Yeah, yeah. I mean, back when you know my my pen test days, the, the most reverse shells do not take uh, a whole lot. Um, <laughs> you know, it, you can you can stuff it in the you know less than a couple k in some instances, depending on the encoding. And uh, but yeah, I mean, just the the number of groups that have started to to piggyback on this is just nuts. I mean, I was I was going through a list. Uh, you know, we've we've got you mentioned Hafnium. There's Tick. Lucky Mouse, Calypso, WebSick, WinNT, wow, excuse me, WinNTI, Tonto, Microscene. I mean, just it's it's just blowing up, and uh, just the the sheer uh, scale of of the the effects. I mean, it's it's global at this point, and it's hitting some pretty big, uh, pretty big organizations. Like you got the European Banking Authority, you've got the Norwegian Parliament. Uh, you've got a bunch of uh, East Asian IT services, yeah. Uh, Central Asia, Middle East, government orgs in Africa. Like it's, um, it's hard to overstate how how widespread this is. Um, it, it's also hard to understate how challenging it is to talk to the clients and talk to people about how you you, f- you find this in your environment. You've got all this active traffic potentially beaking it out, and then. The other follow-up piece to that is once you get that traffic under control, then you have to start looking at, okay, you've, you've closed the door to the hackers, but are they still in your environment and have they planted any sort of backdoor, any sort of malware? So then we have this follow-up piece of this breach that makes it really challenging. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really do wonder how much of this, you know, is, uh, you know, are, are, is there persistence that's just waiting dormant, you know, and uh, that's that's when, you know, when you have this level of compromise that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people will try and uh, take the approach of, oh, well, I can just clean the malware up and, you know, block off these ports and I'll be good. And it's, uh, you, you can't guarantee that there isn't something that, you know, is is just going to fire up a month from now or who knows how long, you know, it's uh, you, you're best going from uh, a clean slate known good baseline. All right, Forrest, there's two parts to this Exchange server update. And we mentioned the first part, Hafnium, China Chapa. But we also got to talk about the second part, which is how did so many groups have the ability to execute on this Exchange server flaw so quickly? And that's the question that researchers are trying to ask right now. Why were there so many different? I mean, at minimum, there's 12 APTs that just seem to right away be able to execute on these four CVEs, these four flaws, and they were able to take action. So what's going on right now behind the scenes is Microsoft's trying to figure out th- how did all of these groups basically obtain a proof of concept, a POC attack code, and the company distributed that attack code to their partners back on February 23rd. And there's about 80 or so of these security partners that belong to the MAP program, which is the Microsoft Active Protections Program. These are security partners that will utilize the code, will try to help develop the code, will help help try to take action with the code and make their Microsoft products even stronger as part of their product line as well. So these 80 or so security partners are being investigated. And the, f- the answer is, how did they know? Were they Was the code leaked? I mean, there's a lot of theories out there, Forrest, and the, the plausible theories come down to three. I'll tell you what those three theories are, but I want to hear your opinion first, Forrest, on how yeah. you think what's going on. Yeah, it was it was interesting that they they noted uh, four new groups uh, started utilizing the the, the vulnerabilities uh, within 24 hours of the patches being released. Now, Incredible. I mean, naturally, yeah, you can you can reverse engineer based off of you know, what binaries you're getting from the patches uh, and try and figure it out that way. But four different groups, all within a 24-hour period, um, and some of them just within within hours of, of the patch. So probably not uh, the, the source there. Maybe there's, there's some type of collusion. Uh, maybe it's up for sale. Maybe, maybe uh, one of the orgs that, that is part of that program uh, may have... Um, you know, uh, a mole or uh, just 
who knows, maybe they, they just have uh, their own malware problem that they're still needing to root out. I mean, there's, it's, there's, there's any number of ways that this, this could have come about. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing that security researchers, including Microsoft, are trying to figure out. The, the different plausible theories that could explain why so many APTs were able to have this code so quickly and use the exploit. So uh, the, the one theory is the exploit was for sale on the underground forums, on the black market, on the dark web. Another theory is something you mentioned. Uh, maybe the groups, they, when they created the exploit, they shared it with other groups, and we don't know the reasons why. And then a third theory that exists are all the various groups are organized by one entity, and that's who provided the exploit to all the different groups. I mean, they just had it so quick for us. It's just unreal how much they were able to take advantage of the situation. I mean, just this thing just exploded. You, you talk about January 6th, the security researchers find it, find, the, find these four flaws, but... We're going all the way back to October of the last year and September of the last year trying to figure it out. I mean, that's how long ago this we have to do our research. So fascinating stuff, guys, as the cyber world burns. Yeah.